This lecture starts a series of lectures where we're going to discuss the different features, whether standard or optional, that you're going to find on most timers. Now we're going to talk about manual operation. So we know from our discussion of programming a timer that we're endeavoring to set up a program to tell the timer what time we want it to automatically operate. But let's say it's on the weekend and we just put down some fertilizer and we'd like to go ahead and run either a single zone or the entire system right now as if it were 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, or however you have your timer set up. Almost all timers that I know of give you the option of triggering either a single zone or the entire cycle. Even the analog versions have a way for you to go ahead and trigger that cycle so that you don't have to alter the timers understanding of what time it actually is and try to trick it into coming on as if it were four in the morning or whatever you've got it set up to run. So as a technician and you're going out to do an inspection or adjust some heads or whatever it is, we're almost always going to be using the manual feature on these timers. Some timers have the capability to run what's called a test cycle, which will go through and run each zone in order for maybe two minutes. So this allows you to punch one button and then walk away from the timer and maybe if you have a big property as you're walking around it's going to turn each zone on for two minutes in succession so that you can check the operation of each of these zones. Now if you're adjusting heads two or three minutes it isn't going to give you enough time to do that. That's why generally I'm going to trigger each zone manually as I need it or if you have a remote control in your pocket you can just trigger it as you need it to advance to the next manual operation of a zone. In this lecture we're going to talk about the timer feature called global adjust. It's also called seasonal adjust or water budget. Sometimes you'll see it called adjust water percentage. And usually if there's an icon on a timer, it's a percentage symbol that tells you that this feature is there. And this is a good feature, but I rarely see anybody ever use it. Um, with my company, generally what we do is we take the local ET rates, the evapotranspiration rate, and we figure out for the month of July or August which is going to be the peak demand for our irrigation system and we set this up as a hundred percent in our timer. For these global adjust settings they generally range from zero to hundred and fifty percent and so how you use it is you set your timer up at peak usage and set that as a hundred percent and then you instruct your homeowner or if it's your timer then you go out as needed according to weather demands or seasonal increase or decrease in temperature and then you can just use that one button to adjust your entire system up or down as far as the run times for each individual zone. This is really a time saving device and let's say that you had a timer with 30 zones and you wanted to decrease the run time, well it might take you you know a little while to sit there and adjust each individual zone in the timer. Well the global adjust gives you a chance to just adjust all of the times at once up or down according to your desire. And what we do, like I mentioned earlier, is we use a, an evapotranspiration rate. It's a table that we find from a Clemson Agricultural Extension Service here and it tells us the amount of water that's evaporating from the ground or transpiring from plants at its peak. And here in South Carolina uh, we generally lose about six inches of water from the ground around the peak time which is July. So what I do is I set the timers up um, at the peak usage, set all of the run times to accommodate that amount of demand and we set the global adjust at a hundred percent. So when we start off in the spring, then we may want to set that global adjust at maybe 50 or 60 percent of the 100 percent maximum and then increase as water demand increases. Leave it at 100 percent for the couple of months through the summer, usually the majority of June, July, and August. And then we use that global adjust to bring the times back down and ramp it back down in the fall. And if you use this method to control your irrigation system, 
you can save about 25% on your water and that way you're only supplying the amount of water to your landscape that it actually needs. If you remember back from our first lesson, one of the goals in irrigation is not only to water our landscape properly, but to do it in a cost efficient manner. And the way that most people set their irrigation timers up, they generally set it for you know one standard time. They turn it on in the spring and then they let it run like that all across the summer. But if you look at the actual water needs of our system, it's actually more like a bell curve. Starts off low in the spring, ramps up for summer, and then goes back down for winter and fall. There's another feature that most timers have that's called a rain delay. This is a great feature to use if you don't have a rain gauge or a ground moisture sensor or anything like that attached to your system. I find a lot of times that people that are around the house a lot, maybe they're retirees, maybe self-employed and they work out of the house, but some people like to keep an eye on their system and just switch it on and off as they feel it's necessary according to the rain or the temperature. I personally don't like this method. I would prefer that you have some level of automation on that, whether it is a rain gauge or a ground moisture sensor, so that you can accurately suspend watering when it's needed. The problem with turning it on and off yourself is that maybe you're leaving the house for the day and you're expecting to get some rain. Maybe the weatherman has told you that we're going to get a half inch that day. And really what happens is you only get just a, a light rain and it doesn't even come close to replacing the watering event that you suspended for the day. So, you know, if you only get a really shallow watering and you think that that's good enough, you may actually be hurting your landscape and depriving it of that deep watering that it really needs. So I would be careful about using this, but if you just don't want to have a rain gauge or a ground moisture sensor, this is an acceptable option. Some timers track this with a single number and when you hit the rain delay, it's going to show you an either a one, a two, or a three. And that means that you're suspending the watering program by that many days. You punch one and it's just going to suspend it for one day. Run it up to two, it's going to suspend it for two days. You get the picture. But other timers like this one we're showing here, this orbit timer, will give it to you in hours. And this one will only let you do 24, 48, 72 hours. But other timers give you the option of 12 hours, 24, 36, 48. So it really just depends on the timer that you've got. But like I mentioned before, I would urge you to use this feature cautiously and be careful not to suspend a watering if it's only going to be a minimal rain event. Most manufacturers offer a modular version of their timers, which allows for expansion of the number of zones allowed by way of individually purchased modules that fit into the back of the timer. Usually these models come with one module in it and that'll have three or four zone terminals, a master valve and pump terminal, and also a terminal for your common wires. Um, and usually these will expand by way of these individual modules up to 12, maybe 15 zones that it'll accommodate. And some of the larger timers are modular and some of those have modules of 10 or 15 that can plug in for some of the larger properties or commercial properties that you might be dealing with. Usually when these modules are inserted, there's some type of locking mechanism inside here. We're taking a look at a Hunter Pro C that has a, a locking mechanism, so you have to unlock it, push the module all the way in, making sure that it firmly is inserted into its little notch, and then close the locking mechanism back up. This is also something to watch out for in the troubleshooting process. If you have one or more zones that aren't operational and the rest of them are, check the modules. A lot of times just from the expansion of the heat, from you know the plastic expanding and contracting, maybe if it's been mounted out in the sun, sometimes these little modules will work their way loose and it won't look like it's out of its socket. But if you're having a problem with, say, three out of the 12 total zones that you have operating from that particular timer, well, just pull the module out and push it back in. Now, it's always a good idea when you're messing with the modules to unplug the power to the timer uh, before you insert one or pull it back out just to make sure that there's no arcing or anything that will happen that would damage any of those components. Most timers come in an outdoor model. 
These will usually have a locking case on the outside, but don't make the assumption that just because a timer has an outer case or a locking front panel that that means it's an outdoor version. Usually what you're looking for is the presence of an internal transformer instead of the wall warp style transformer that comes with it and you just generally have to you know plug that into the terminals or whatever. Usually these outdoor timers will require a more robust style of plug-in. We refer to it as a pigtail and all it really is is a thicker version of a three-pronged outlet plug. And what you're going to need to do when you're looking at where to mount an outdoor timer, you either need an outdoor receptacle, it should be a GFCI, a ground fault circuit interrupter, but it can also be just hardwired in from something, you know, inside the foundation. And a lot of times, you know, that's what we have to do when we're looking at the most advantageous place to put an outdoor timer. Most of the time you don't have a nearby power receptacle for that. So you end up having to have an electrician maybe set you up with a, a hardwired connection for it. 